Thank you. And your name? I'm Felicia Smith. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another Felicia, thank you so much for welcoming us into your backyard and showing us this beautiful unit. This is the housing we so desperately need. I'm Nancy Skinner. I'm state senator, and I'm glad to be uh, joined with by all, so many of my colleagues and our governor, who's going to sign some bills today, um, and I'll let them talk about it. But one of the bills we're signing is, uh, luckily, they're going to be signing, the governor's going to be signing a number of bills that do this kind of unit. But in addition to that, SB 330, which is my bill, um, we all know that housing is a human right, but it is something that a lot of Californians are not really having right now. We have the highest rents and the highest cost of purchasing a house of any state, and we got to do better. So what does SB 330 do? Um, it deals with the fact that too often many in our community say, hey, yeah, we need housing, but don't build it here. Build it somewhere else. So what SB 330 does is treats our housing shortage like the shortage and the crisis that it is, and it gives a green light to the housing that each and every one of our communities has already planned for. So it's housing that's already been conceptually approved. It gives a green light. And it prevents the delays, the rules changing midstream, and other game playing that keeps the housing that we so desperately need from being built. So in recently, We've been focused, we in the legislature, on what we call the three Ps, protection, production, and preservation. And yesterday, the governor signed some really brilliant protection bills. Today, we're dealing with the production bills, and SB 330 is one of the core production bills, uh, along with the other ones that will be signed. And I'm really proud to be here, and I'm so glad my colleagues all backed the bill, and that Governor Newsom will also. I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator. And David, why don't you, why don't you talk? Just and I'm going to I'm going to act like Phil Donahue, but you, some of you are too young to know who Phil Donahue is. Uh, but that that certainly ages me. But uh, but I want to take advantage because all of you are here for a reason, because all of you have contributed to this moment and all of you have had a number of bills, some that I'm signing today, others that I signed yesterday, uh, others uh, that uh, likely will be signed over the course of the next few days. Um, but uh, some of Chu, yesterday we were up in Oakland uh, in your backyard and we were talking, as, uh, as the senator said, around the issues uh, or speaking to the issues specifically uh, around uh, protection. Uh, but you have a bill on density bonuses that I'll be signing today, which is an important one. Uh, it makes perfect sense, but it will make more sense when we expand it. But that's next year's agenda. But this year's agenda um, focuses on this idea of low and middle income housing density bonuses in and around transit. Thank you, Mr. Governor, and first of all, thank you for your leadership in helping the legislature prioritize during the most intense housing crisis in our state's history. Um, AB 1763 uh, is a bill that has come out of struggles of affordable housing developers and communities that are looking to build affordable housing. It's a bill that would use the incentive of density bonuses in affordable housing projects to really turbocharge the production of affordable housing, particularly around transit. We know we need to build millions of units of new housing in order to stabilize our markets. Every colleague here has a part in bills to move that forward. Uh, but this is really focused on 100% affordable projects. And I want to just take a moment and thank the California Housing Consortium and so many others who are instrumental for it. Appreciate that. Well, you want to just go down, because we, we signed one of your bills yesterday as well. well maybe we talk a one about yesterday. And thank, thank you. you. Um, well, I want to first thank the governor for his commitment to housing. When I ran for local office in 2009, housing wasn't as much on people's radar. I'm Laura Friedman, and I'm the assembly member for the 43rd district, which includes Hollywood and Glendale, Burbank, La Cunada. Uh, now, if you ask anyone in my district, pretty much everyone will say that housing is the number one concern, given the number of homeless people we see on the streets and the number of housed residents who are housing insecure and wor worried about being one rent check away from being on the streets themselves. Uh, I put five housing bills on the governor's desk. He signed, um, I think, all but two, and those two, I think, are sitting on the desk here. I did three bill bills that dealt specifically with ADUs. 
Our city controller, Ron Galperin, reported just this week in the LA Times that affordable housing units in Los Angeles are now averaging $600,000 per unit. And at that cost, we cannot provide the kind of affordable housing that we need, even for a fraction of our community. But with ADUs, we have the power to harness a real public-private partnership with private homeowners to help provide an ADU that will add a good unit for an individual or a family in stable neighborhoods with access to good schools and good amenities in a way that's low impact for our communities and that also adds an asset for the homeowner. It's a great solution and I'm glad to see the model that's being shown here today. I was really proud to have put three bills dealing with ADUs on the governor's desk and we have a lot more work to do to remove the barriers that a lot of communities of cities have put up to block the full deployment of ADUs in our communities. I'm Senator Bob Wykowski, and I'm, I guess, start the ball rolling with the ADUs with uh, Richard Bloom four years ago. Um, there's, as Laura and as uh, Nancy has indicated, there's a lot of barriers. One of the things, one of the barriers that we're hoping to remove here is impact fees that, that cities are charging as a way to discourage people from building ADUs. And with the governor's signature, any unit that's 750 feet or less will not pay any city impact fees. This is treating homeowners like developers instead of just somebody in their backyard adding it another uh, bedroom. Uh, you know, I've worked with uh, Phil Ting the last couple of years to to speed up the process. You know, we're, we've got bills that are going to uh, shrink the approval uh, period to 60 days. We found out that in 1977, California passed an act for administrative streamlining that all these decisions that local governments are supposed to make should be made in 60 days. There's an amnesty program that's in uh, SB uh, 13. The city of Los Angeles, sorry that Mayor Garcetti's not here, has done a wonderful job of building ADUs over the last three years since uh, SB 1069 came into existence, but they believe that there's about a quarter of a million undocumented or unpermitted uh, um, ADUs here, and SB uh, 13 sets a guideline on how that's going, how that amnesty program's uh, going to work. And then finally, I just would point out that a lot of cities, another barrier that cities have put up is that they're requiring the homeowner live on the property, and they can't, they can't have a rental that would allow them to, or, or to move. And we have a program, we, only, we had to accept language that's only five years, but one of the other barriers is requiring that homeowners live on the properties where if you own a triplex or a duplex, you don't do it. So, Mr. Governor, thank you for uh, your efforts today in helping remove some of these barriers. There's still more to go, as Laura indicated, because a lot of cities just hate ADUs, and they just hate, they talk about helping with housing, but they really create a situation where it's impossible. And I'm not suggesting your city hates ADUs, but I am passing the mic on to you. <laughs> I, I think of it as your city, Governor. <laughs> um, well, our, well, our city ha has come a long way in terms of ADUs, and thanks to uh, Assemblymember Chu when he was on the Board of Supervisors. And uh, I have AB 68, which along with Senator Wykowski's bill is really part of this streamlining effort for ADU. You heard from my colleague Laura Friedman about how much it costs to build a unit of housing. Well, this unit costs $79,000 to build. So if we could get Five of these for one typical unit. Imagine what we could do to the housing crisis. Uh, what we've seen in L.A. is once Senator Wykowski's work was done and they started to really streamline efforts in L.A., they issued in one year, 2018, over 10,000 permits. And the difference between ADU permits and what I would say is a typical development permit is a developer permit, the, the permit gets issued, and then someday, maybe five or ten years down the road, that housing gets built. You, you remember that, Governor. Um, ADU permits is they get pulled, and they start building pretty quickly. And the whole point with AB 68 was to make it almost like an over-the-counter approach, no different than remodeling a kitchen, no, no different than remodeling a bathroom, really taking away some of the discrimination around lot sizes, really making it, as, as Senator Wykowski talked about, faster so that it's easier to go build. And we also added in junior ADUs. So a property owner could not only do an ADU, but also a junior ADU. Th this would qualify as a junior ADU because our, under our, our bill is uh, 500 square feet or under. So again, uh, this is part of our overall 
attack on the housing crisis. We know this will not solve it, but we hope that this will take a big, uh, a big bite out of it. We hope that with the signing of these bills that we'll see tens of thousands of ADUs get permitted over the next few years. Thank you and welcome. My name is Steve Bradford, Senator from the 35th Senate District, and I'm honored to join my colleagues who have made a strong commitment to affordable housing. And I think one of the things we need to do in this measure is going to help change the paradigm of what we consider affordable housing or low-income housing. It's far often stigmatized, but as you can see, this is a middle-class neighborhood, and we're putting uh, affordable units here. So if you live in San Francisco and make $125,000, you can't afford probably a unit like this. So it's uh, important that we do the legislation. I joined Senator Wyckowski last year with an ADU bill, and I do represent a district where I have a lot of nemeism going on, where they don't want units like this in their backyards. But we're going to have to change that. We're going to continue to work until I'm honored to be here today, and I thank the governor for his leadership and vision on this issue. Thank you. My name is Sydney Kamlogger Dove, and I'm the Assemblywoman for the 54th. I want to welcome the governor and my colleagues and all of you to my district. I actually live a few blocks away from this home. And thank you to Felicia for opening your doors uh, and your new ADU to us. Uh, I was one of the votes that helped many of these bills get across the finish line and onto the governor's desk. I'm, I'm waiting for him to sign a few of mine. I know he has until Sunday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Um, but this is, we have a housing crisis, we have an affordability crisis, and we have a middle income, middle class crisis across this state. And it takes multiple solutions. No bill is the single answer. No bill is the single bullet. Uh, we have to look at how we define supply and make sure that it comes in a number of different hues and tones and costs. We have to talk about the fact that this state is becoming more and more unaffordable every single day with huge disparities between the high income and everyone else. And lastly, we have to talk about the middle class, which is shrinking and oftentimes comprised of people of color. And where do they fit in? We all, regardless of our income, deserve shelter, deserve a great paying job, and deserve the opportunity to live with dignity. And many of these bills will do just that, afford folks the opportunity to live with dignity in communities of their choosing. So I applaud the governor for his fortitude and for his commitment and to stepping right into a big, major, complicated issue. Thank you. Well, thank you. I well, that was fast. I got nothing left to say. You guys uh, explain everything. But look, I just want to punctuate the moment. Uh, we hear the choir of critics and criticism about the state of our state. I, I, there's not a soul in Sacramento that does not recognize the affordability crisis in the state, does not recognize what's happening out on our streets in sidewalks. We get it. The question is, can we get something big done? And over the course of the last number of years, there's been a series of initiatives, some small, some larger, uh, that have reinforced a resolve, a commitment to follow through on our promotions, on our promises to address this affordability crisis head on. In addition to the bills we're signing today, close to $3 billion of additional resources was placed in the budget and now is just beginning to be distributed to cities large and small all across the state to tackle the issue of housing, affordability, and homelessness in the state. $1.75 billion uh, in money, new money, uh, just in the housing space, and a billion dollars in the homelessness space. Uh, money itself is not going to solve these problems. We recognize that, uh, but we want to reduce the number of barriers uh, for those at the local level uh, that need that support to get the job done. But at the end of the day, there is no soap substitute for localism. It's an old saw that says localism is determinative. At the end of the day, the state vision of affordability will be realized at the local level, ADU by ADU, local housing project by local housing project in every single part of the state. Why did I say every single part of the state? because we're all in this together. This is not the responsibility and role of downtown Los Angeles. It's the responsibility and role of each and every community throughout the state of California, and I would argue each and every neighborhood throughout the state of California. We can maintain our quality of life, no doubt about that, but we cannot maintain our promise as a state of social mobility, as a state that's attached, like the America that we're living in, to a dream 
unless we allow for social mobility and we allow people to flourish. And the Assemblywoman was absolutely right. The issue of affordability is holding back our economy. It's holding back people's opportunity to enter in the middle class and those that aspire uh, to move out of the middle class into another bracket. We're moving increasingly from a three-class society to a two-class society. Uh, my mother reminded me when she started working her second job, even after my father had moved out, that she was earning 104 paychecks, not 52. Uh, we are seeing a generational decline in optimism, fundamentally because of the issue that brought us here in your backyard today. So we are resolved to solve it. We are not here to overpromise. We are sober about the realities and the timelines associated with delivering on our promises, but know that we are energized and we recognize the urgency of now. And so I just want to compliment the incredible leadership uh, that is assembled here today. I was blessed to be with a number of you yesterday in Oakland. Uh, I was blessed to be with others in San Diego this morning talking about exactly these same issues. We're going to focus on making sure we keep people in their homes. Today we talked about a $331 million endowment that we've set aside to address the issue of predatory practices, be it those that are taking advantage of folks on these reverse mortgages. Tom Selleck, please be a little more forthright in what's really happening in that space. Uh, to look at the issues of PACE financing, and in some cases are burdening homeowners, and the predatory practices in that space. We have to be cautious as it relates to things we promote to make sure we have consumers always at heart. And that's why we also are balancing our efforts to create a fund to help people that can't access uh, that legal protection to be able to access the resources and resourcefulness uh, of experts that can help them in that space. The rent control packages, uh, the work we're doing on Just Cause, uh, the work we're doing uh, to focus now on production anew, not just financing, but production, um, is all, again, a step in the right direction. I'm excited about what's happening with the ADU space. Uh, I think this is an incredible opportunity, as you said, Bob, and I congratulate you for moving in this direction so many years ago and breaking that stubborn log dam. I mean, I, the, the San Francisco folks know we've been, that's a 20 plus year battle, uh, and it's just a non-starter in the past, but we've broken through, you've broken through, and you really have a lot to be proud of. And I can just tell you the time value of money it's not just 600,000 a unit down here or 800 plus thousand up north in some cases. It's the years and years that you suggest of waiting around and the voters saying, didn't we pass a damn bond? Why the hell are not things getting better? And they sit there bewildered and then they lose trust in all of us and each other. And we get more and more divided, more and more discouraged, more and more fearful. And that fundamentally is a society uh, that cannot stand. And so it's about trust building, it's about bu building bridges, but more importantly, it's about today building new housing in California. So thank you all for, for being here. And also just because it's important, I want to recognize the, the head of the California Apartment Association that's here. Uh, we are building coalitions in this state, not just advocates, uh, but industry. And I just want to again compliment uh, the, uh, the work that the Apartment Association is doing to help us with this cause as well. So let me get to your bill first, Senator, uh, SB 330, and we will get through all, I think, seven bills that we're signing today. And then you guys can have at us, because I know none of you are here to talk about rolling blackouts, <laughs> PG&E, and SDG, which is encouraging. Why, why do you think we're here today? Oh, is that why you're here? <laughs> All right. Well, I know why you're here. Yeah, the Northern Californians are headed down south. Nice down there. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, Senator. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. That's an important bill, and I'm grateful to sign it. And this is uh, 1763. You know a thing or two about this, don't you? Um, more density around transit. Just common sense. In every way, shape, or form makes sense. And this is a good and important first step. Congrats for getting something through in this space. That alone merits a signature. Thank you very much, Senator Member. It's awesome. It's awesome. Um, what do we have here? 68. That's you. Yep. 
Look at this. There's a lot of words in here. Yes. <laughs> All right. You read it? You're going to end? Well, you wrote it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every word, every preposition. <laughs> this is great. One of the ADU bills, one of the number that we'll be signing today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, 13. That's a that's a, that's one inch. Oh, look at you! You got your own pen. Look at that. I love it. It's a statement. I don't know if it's a statement. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Six seventy one. This is you, Laura. Thank you. More eighty. I know. No, there's only a thousand bills. So if someone says, "What are you doing on twenty two fifty? Jeez. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Appreciate spending a lot of time this week together. Great. 587, AB 587. This is yours again. <laughs> and I think we got one more, folks. And this is 881. And this is Boom. Who wants to? You want to carry sure, that? Sure. On behalf of your colleagues? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, that's the package we're signing today. As was noted, um, there's still a number of bills uh, that we have yet to act on. I have till Sunday midnight uh, to work through the remaining few hundred bills and probably a hundred or so decisions to be made. Uh, but we're processing the outreach on a lot of these bills and uh, and working to uh, make announcements as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's the purpose that united us here today. Uh, we are here with my spokesperson uh, to answer any questions that you may have, first if we could, on this topic, and then happily on any other topic. You, you want to grab the mic? Then? Oh, sorry. Yeah, forgive us. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. Governor, uh, now that these bills have passed, allowing for an expansion of ADUs, do you plan to put one on your property and rent it out? <laughs> <laughs> I just moved in. I don't know that we have the space. I got so many dogs and rabbits. And uh, I haven't been home in 24 hours knowing my daughter. I may have some other animal uh, that I have to accommodate. But, no, I think, uh, I think the uh, governor's mansion is available for someone if they are interested. I don't know what uh, the going rate is uh, for a mansion uh, in Sacramento. But uh, I imagine there are a number of people that want to move into it, but they should be patient. That's all I have to say on that topic. Anybody else on this issue? Well, I think, I think immediately they have already made an impact. Uh, once there was a sense these were going to get passed and there was a sense of where uh, we may go in terms of our action here today, uh, I think the industry is moving towards that. Uh, of course, most of these go in effect in January, uh, but substantively, and there's an individual behind you uh, that's responsible for the building to your right, our left, uh, that probably could answer that better than any of us, uh, where I imagine this has helped enliven uh, their prospects and encourage them to potentially look, I think, more favorably at their business plan. And perhaps you can talk to that uh, because you're a big part of why we're here. Come on up. You're, a, you're, the, you're the inspiration for a lot of interesting businesses that are starting to crop up in this space. Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay. Any of these help in this space or are we making all this up? Everything we say. You're not making up at all. My name is Stephen Dietz. I'm with United Dwelling. And we looked at the opportunity to build ADUs and realized there was a lot we could do to help, home own, to help homeowners in the construction. So we actually built a business model around this bill and others previously where we partner with the homeowners. Uh, we finance the construction and we share the rental income with them. And that entire business model exists because of this bill and previous ones. So just one indication. So that's real time this is taking shape. And again, this is complimentary to a lot of the good work. And I appreciate the recognition of your mayor uh, here in Los Angeles uh, and the city council that are working uh, very aggressively in this space. And that's demonstrable in terms of the number of permits that have been pulled. All of this is additive. All of this is uh, important. And at the end of the day, to solve our crisis, it's an aggregate uh, of all of these local initiatives and efforts. So very, very important what's happening down here in Los Angeles. Any of you have concerns about the L.A. City Controller's audit yesterday that suggested that the city was not spending AAA bond money appropriately or wisely enough? 
Yeah, I mean, anyone want to speak to that with more detail? I didn't have a chance to read the article. I mean, I read the article. I didn't read the audit. So I, I'd be remiss to respond to it uh, without the details, uh, my knowledge. Anybody that did take the time? Not yet. Hey, look, anytime there's an audit that suggests anything, we all should uh, be attuned uh, to the findings and sensitive to that. And again, none of us are insensitive to the issue of time value of money and then ultimately the cost. And that's, again, a cruise to that frame that I advanced, which is trust. If we're going to go back to the voters and ask them to support a subsequent tax measure, a bond or a sales tax or any increment financing, uh, we have to build that relationship of trust, which means we have to prove ourselves. We say we're going to do something, we have to do it. And so those audits can be helpful, uh, not just uh, destructive of that process because they can waken us up to doing a better job sharpening our focus uh, and making sure we're held to account. Completely, completely untrue. Yeah, it's just amazing. I, I'm sorry to maybe apply. Well, I don't want to say because maybe Donald Trump's not wrong about one thing. And sometimes there's things that are untrue. That's just no. It's I know it's hard for me to say that. I, I, I just I'm bewildered by that misinformation. It's it's jaw-droppingly factually wrong. So it's just made up. It's dare I say a lie that's being perpetuated by somebody for some purpose. Uh, I imagine political, but it's just factually untrue. It's not even debatable how untrue it is. It's just factually untrue. Just gas tax revenues are locked in by the voters. The gas tax levy were locked in by the voters for the stated purpose. It's just, so it's just it's made up, which only concerns me. Not everybody knows that we had a ballot initiative and then another initiative to guarantee that these dollars were locked in. So it's just so strange that even one person reported it. Uh, maybe someone didn't have an editor. It's an argument for editors. Uh, anyway, so those are the facts. Forgive me. We had one other question on this topic. Well, we're going to need a look. I mean, what we're going through right now is what we call this RENA process, and I'll bore you another time explaining what that is. Uh, we are working with local governments all across the state to update their plans and to get a new statewide housing production goal. So we have a stated goal that comes from a series of independent reports that states the need in this state to develop three and a half million housing units in the next you know, six, seven years. The reality at the end of the day is that number uh, was a number based on older studies. We are updating that analysis and we will be putting together new statewide goals that are regionally focused, more detailed, more nuanced, uh, that will allow us to answer that question with specificity. Oh, yeah, Just if I can add to the production. So as the governor mentioned, our current estimate is that we need 3.5 million. We probably need more. But of that 3.5 million, the bills that he just signed, we're going to get very close if it works as we intend. You know, and we know that we may have to tweak some things. But SB 330, the bill that he signed first, my bill, allows for local governments to move much quickly, more quickly, on that which is already in their housing elements. There's about 2.3 to 2.4 million units that have conceptually been approved but not built. And SB 330 gives the green light to those. So if we then think about the other million that we need just in that initial 3.5, there's the potential easily in this state to have a million ED ADUs, secondary units like this easily so we conceivably can get to the 3.5 million just with what was signed today though we know we probably will have to do more i'm glad you grabbed that mic mm -hmm. thank you yeah 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 no well and, and the, so I'm David Chu. I'm the assembly member who was the author of 1482, along with a number of others. Very much thank you to the governor and his team for working with us on that. I also chaired the assembly housing committee. Let me just say a few things about that. Um, the bill has a couple of aspects to it. One is the rent cap. And as of January 1st, 2020, a tenant cannot be charged more than what that person's rent was as of March of this year, plus the consumer price index plus 5%. So 
in the meantime, at this moment, uh, a landlord, if they choose to do this because they want to, they could jack up the rent 100%, but it would have to be reduced by January the 1st. Now, that being said, we are hearing these disturbing reports, and uh, we had wanted to figure out how to address this, but there's only so much we could do. Uh, we really couldn't move back retroactively, which is why what I mentioned of the rule on the rent cap would only apply January 1st moving forward. But what I would say to those landlords is a few things. Um, they will have the opportunity to raise their rents by CPI plus 5% every year for the next 10 years. That is more than enough headroom for these landlords to make a fair rate of return. I want to thank the California Apartment Association who's here who can attest to that as well. Everyone knows if you are doing a good job, that is the case. But if you want to be greedy, you can continue to do what unfortunately – some landlords have been doing, which is in part why we're in the situation we're on right now. The last thing I want to say is the public tenant advocates, we are watching and we are monitoring. And if we are seeing that there are certain landlords who are doing this, we're going to follow and know who these individuals are. Um, there will likely be a lot of publicity around it. I don't think it's going to be great for business. Um, and we'll just tell folks to be forewarned. You couldn't have said that better. And, you know, it just do the right thing. You know, and uh, I think it was my mother said, if you want to, Eat more, eat less, so you can live longer. <laughs> so just, if, are we off the housing? Because I want to spare all these folks. You guys, you don't have to sit around for this. If you wish or stand around, uh, you're, you're be my guest. Uh, but forgive me. The uh, question of uh, a state of emergency, uh, we're monitoring the necessity of that. Uh, we've been working very collaboratively with city and local leaders. Uh, we have created what we call a SOC, which is our state operations center that was put together a number of days ago. Uh, and we have state local agencies that are part of that, and we're staying in constant contact and communication with local leaders. Uh, we provided $75 million in anticipation of this moment in this year's budget. Uh, we had previewed the likelihood of something like this happening this year uh, earlier uh, in the year in January and February. Uh, and so that money is being made available. And to the extent uh, the needs are greater than that, we'll consider the next steps. Well, I mean, I, look, I, no one's happy to see their power cut off. So no one is satisfied. No one's pleased. And let me just say this. There's a reason they're a bankrupt investor-owned utility. It's because of mismanagement. Decades and decades of mismanagement. We shouldn't be in this position. There should be very small, isolated blackouts or uh, de-energization along the lines of what you see more of in San Diego, uh, which is a model, not just for the state, but in many respects, the nation, uh, and more along the lines of Southern California Edison. What pg and is doing at scale is absolutely unnecessary had they done their job over the course of the last few decades and then invested in their infrastructure and their transmission lines and modernizing it so they could be more precise uh, and much more targeted. Uh, so this should never happen again. It's the nature of the moment. I do not deny the need and necessity to meet the moment in a prophylactic sense, meaning prevention, profoundly important. As I said, this is not unique in Southern California, particularly where I was this morning in San Diego. They do this often. pg and &E never did it. Uh, now, we're all paying a price, literally, not figuratively, as consumers. All IOUs are being impacted by the failure of PG&E uh, to have addressed these issues. We're trying to work that out. And as you know, we passed a landmark piece of legislation, a sense of urgency to do so. But we're going to hold them to account, and uh, we're going to do our best to monitor as we are, hour by hour, uh, the next 48 or so hours of the most acute, uh, at least, needs in, in Northern California. Yeah. And, I mean, no. Kind of uh, we're, that's all we're doing. Uh, we're we're providing. So we're we're going through. We have a, a series of. Uh, we, we review all of this. Uh, we have experts from Cal Fire. We're working with the National Weather Service. We're addressing and monitoring the weather patterns. Uh, the winds, at least as an hour or so ago, uh, have been pretty consistent between 15 and 25 miles an hour, a little less than we had anticipated at this moment, but there are heavier gusts. The humidity is particularly low. We're experiencing conditions that you're about to experience 
tomorrow, potentially into Saturday down here. Santa Ana's are starting to move in. Uh, that requires a series of things and actions that include pre-positioning, include working with local municipalities and governments to address their new needs as it relates to making sure uh, that we have backup generators, making sure we go through their list of assets and we complement those assets or we supplement those assets in the same as being requested and demanded of PG&E as well. So the answer is yes. It's nuanced. It's tailored at the local level. We currently are anticipating up to 747,000 households to be impacted as they go from phase one into phase two and phase three. We have not gone to all three phases yet, and it may not require going as high as 740,000, but that's the exposure. Just shy of two million people. Uh, each of those customers is a school, is a business, is a household. So roughly two million people impacted. They have not gone through the process yet of assessing whether or not they hit, need to hit that third phase, and that ultimately is being determined in consultation with a lot of the experts. It's uh, I, I, my kids are home right now. Um, I mean, I, I'm just saying this: everybody in Northern California, in some way, shape, or form, directly or indirectly, is being impacted by this. We have to focus on three things as primary goal: public safety, public health and doing our best to mitigate business interruption. And we're, and we're doing everything in our power to do that. Again, no one is satisfied with this, but I do believe with the limited number of tools in the toolkit, what they're doing is appropriate under the circumstance. Because I'll tell you what would not be appropriate, to not turn off the lights and literally turn our back to public safety and put the lives of thousands of people at risk. And that's not a gross exaggeration. Look what's happened in the state in the last two years. Uh, we cannot experience another Woolsey. We cannot experience another campfire. We cannot allow that to happen on our watch. And so far this year, we've been blessed relative to arguably the last decade. And we don't want to run through the season not having done everything we should have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, let's be more pedestrian and talk about just even able to pump gas. So look, or open your garage door. Um, make sure, you know, you uh, you can, you know, keep your food uh, safe uh, in the refrigerator. So all of that uh, is being assessed and addressed, um, but never as comprehensively as one would like. This is a scale and scope which you haven't experienced and we've got 20 of these operation centers up uh, that provide people access to water. Uh, we have a emergency protocol as it relates to uh, fuel distribution. It's not a lack of fuel, it's a lack of access to the fuel. Uh, so through the Office of Emergency Services they're putting together those protocols again all as needed. We're hearing that as early as noon tomorrow they can in certain circumstances start turning back the lights but they cannot do that until they physically assess the transmission lines. Because with these heavy winds, those lines go down and you flip the switch back on, that's a fire danger. So there's a physical constraint. And that's why you suck in terms of those number of days. Uh, it's not necessarily the fact we don't want or can't turn the lights back on, but public safety would dictate that we have to do a lot of that manual labor first. And you said there's 20 um, different uh, operation centers. Yeah. Yeah, that we've that that uh, PG&E is funded directly, or have been supplemented through county folk, uh, funding and state efforts. Yeah. And that's again providing water to people if they need it. What else? Complement of issues, including access to forgive me, uh, electricity to charge your cell phone, uh, simple uh, uh, access to uh, whatever small uh, devices one may need, from crank devices to flashlights, other things uh, that will be distributed. Uh, larger. Uh, industrial support as it relates to backup generators. Obviously, there's been a lot of outreach to uh, critical care facilities, senior centers, hospitals. Uh, a lot of them, fortunately, already have redundancy in place. Uh, by the way, uh, blackouts are not unique, uh, unfortunately, uh, in Northern California. They've never, of course, been proactively uh, done at this scale, uh, but we do experience a lot of these extremes, and so a lot of these protocols have been well established, and frankly, they're protocols uh, in a world of seismic uncertainty uh, that also are a requisite uh, in terms of preparation. Well, anything like that be available in Southern California? Yeah. Yeah, we're working, uh, we've been working hand-in-glove with Edison and SDGE. 
uh, we've been working uh, with your local uh, elected officials uh, and your county representatives, Cal Fires down here. I mean, everybody's working very collaboratively. As you know, uh, Southern California Edison is also, it's not just PG&E and Kern County. They've turned off the lights. Kern County uniquely has PG&E in their territory and Edison in their territory. So we're working through those collaborative, uh, collaborative frameworks as well. Uh, San Diego has not yet, but that was an hour ago. You may know more because you have access to your cell phone and your Twitter feed. Perhaps they have, but everybody is prepared. And as I said, those uh, winds are coming down here. Uh, and over the course of the next few days will be uh, determinative in terms of our ability to get out of this. And uh, this is the new normal. Hots are getting hotter. The dries are getting drier. The wets are getting wetter. Uh, for those that don't believe in climate change, come to California. Uh, this is the future if we don't meet it head on. And that's why we are very aggressive in the low carbon green growth space, and not just in terms of emergency preparedness uh, and suppression strategies. Thank you all. Thank you all.